everybody. I am Jason Alexander here with... <laughs> you were waiting for the once again, weren't you? You were waiting for the once again. I didn't give it to you this time. Just tell people who you are. Go ahead. Don't you be mean, thrown by me. Can Go I just ahead. say something from my heart? Go ahead. friends yes. for 30 years. Sure. You exhaust me. I am. I'm Peter Tilden. We are the hosts of Really No Really, the show where we explore things that make Peter and I say, Really? really? No. no. Really? That's right. Really? Now today we're we're gonna get to, we're gonna get very cerebral, literally very cerebral, because we're talking about neurolinks, the connection between brains and tech. And tech. This first of all, I'm so in over my head. You know, I'm not a tech guy. Are you consider yourself a tech guy? I'm not. I'm not that much of a tech guy, but oddly enough. Yeah, I was studying the blood-brain barrier and Parkinson's disease and stuff. Whoa, and, 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 whoa, whoa! And, and 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 for like the longest time now, they're trying. The, the brain is still fascinating in the sense that they're trying to identify the areas of the brain that satiation, because you can make a lot of money yeah. if you can do that and and make people feel full. Sure. So, okay. Yeah. And they've done great things with Parkinson's. They've done yes. great things with epilepsy. Sure. And the doctor we're going to have on today, and I'm thrilled we have him because he's a major guy out of Philadelphia, has done great things with sight. I mean, the great positive parts of all this stuff is moving forward with people who are paralyzed. They're doing all kinds of stuff with spinal cord stimulation now, mm -hmm. which is mind blower. And, and that by willing it, you can move your limbs. Where it gets a little bit crazy now is when you're connected directly to tech. You're the mouse and you can text you can do all kinds of stuff with your brain, play games. The heart moving one was that an ALS patient who, who had no movement in his arms gave a message, and I forget, it was, it was just a couple of words, but oh, hello, hello world, because he could communicate yes. with the world. So imagine yes. your family being able to communicate with you, et cetera. However, sure, the opposite there's a lot side of, is, uh, yeah, there's I money involved. It. Where, it's a two way path, yes, yes. and if, if it can get signals from your brain into a computer, then obviously it can get from the computer into your so brain. So we wanted an expert on because right. Elon Musk. Because I really know really to that. Yeah, go ahead. If I'm going to lay it out, is we are closer than you think to being able to link your brain directly to your computer. Really? No, no really. So let's find out. We got uh, Dr. Danny Yosher, who is nationally recognized neurosurgeon, neuroscientist. He is the chair of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and he's folk, I, 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 you, talk, you say hi and talk about your, your expertise because there's so much that you've done not only working with these kind of interfaces. That's why we wanted you because I read an article. I read about a lot of experts. But you said I know the interface. I mean, I know what they're doing. Since you do this, you've seen brains up close. We were curious what your take was. So thanks for coming on. Uh, well, thank you for having me. And, and uh, if you're going to get into something that's really elicits a really no really, the human brain is it. I mean. You are uh, spot on here. Um, and this is a fascinating area, and I think you've already alluded to the concerns that exist. Um, if we are able to really harness the power of the brain and interface it with computer technology to the betterment of human lives, there are clearly important concerns about ethical considerations. What if someone could make a chip that just made you smarter? Are we going to uh, pay for added intelligence? Will we be doing uh, cosmetic surgery for the brain, so to speak? The ethics of the potential for controlling people's brains. These are uh, big concerns, and, and uh, it's important not only for scientists to address these concerns, but concerned citizens like, like, like you to address these concerns. So, so I'm glad, I'm excited to have this conversation today. So let me just, add, so I, I introduced this, Dr. Yusher, as saying we are closer than you think to being able to link your brain to your computer. Now, you know, for 20,000 years I've heard, you know, we're really close to having flying cars and there's no flying cars. How, are we doing this? Are we in it? Is it, is it being used with any uh, real success and facility? Uh, how, where, where are we with it? Great question. Well. There are a couple of uses that are really happening, and, and your partner uh, mentioned one of them, and that is the concept of deep brain stimulation for movement disorders like Parkinson's disease. Um, that's sort of a magical situation, Parkinson's disease, because in the 1970s, some um, 
tainted uh, synthetic heroin caused uh, a Parkinson-like syndrome in unfortunate patients who took this tainted drug called MPTP. And this led to an animal model of Parkinson's disease that allowed neuroscientists and neurosurgeons to really study the circuits with great precision. And they were able to determine that putting an electrode in a specific part of the brain and turning on activity in that part of the brain could dramatically ameliorate or improve tremors and other motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And that's been implanted in hundreds of thousands of patients to great benefit. So that's an example of a real life brain computer interfacing device that's used to help patients. Absolutely. There is another device that's in use commonly uh, for patients with epilepsy. If you can find the spot in the brain where epilepsy is coming from. Traditionally, we try to take out that spot of the brain to end future seizures. But sometimes that part of the brain is in a critical area. And as you can imagine, we don't want to take away, for example, a person's ability to talk just to cure their epilepsy. So another route to treat epilepsy is to put an electrode in that part of the brain where the seizures normally spontaneously occur. And there's a sensor in this device that detects when a seizure is about to happen and immediately then stimulates the brain to sort of short circuit the seizure. And that's quite effective in helping patients with epilepsy. So those are two examples of things we, those are flying cars that are happening right now to borrow. Which, but, may, I say, may I say two, yeah. this, a thing here, which and sure. I, don't, I don't think you'll mind, it's weird because my mom had Parkinson's, which is why I knew about the blood brain barrier and the fact that sure. it's antinagrodized and you got to give it, yeah. you got to trick the brain because the brain doesn't want anything to get to it. It wants to protect it. So I kind of have a con interest in that. When you do brain surgery and you open up the skull, for you it's a, it's a thing, I, Wednesday I got three, five, Friday I got five. Brain surgery, because when they said it to us as parents, they go, hey, we, what, what we may, and he, they say it kind of like, yeah, we may have to do brain surgery, like it's nothing. Not like it's nothing, but it's not a concern as it comes out of their mouth. And parents or family members hear it, your hair goes like back like the Max Sella, and you go, oh, it, it's a major thing. Is it a major thing? The brain is, is it that fragile? Does it repair itself? How, how can you hit the wrong place? Do we know where we're hitting? Do you know the voltage you should be using? Do we have the stuff ironed out, I guess I'm saying? You know when you go in exactly what you're doing? Modern brain surgery is remarkably safe. Um, we know what we can do very well. And of course, there are cases where we're pushing the limits of what we can do, where we're forced to because of really serious problems, that there's no choice, that they can't be ignored or put off. But for the most part, you know, we're, we're blessed to live in a time where between technology and, and gathered experience over decades, modern brain surgery, the you know the, the mortality from brain surgery is very very low, and, and and the good that it does for society is great. Are you hitting and the spot what, by hand, or is it mechanical? I mean, do you have, because it's like I'm guessing. Boy, I got to hit that. I hope. Yeah, I'm, I hope I don't sneeze. Hope I don't sneeze. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Or, don't or something, and all of a sudden, it's um, always motor skills are going. When when we're targeting a specific area, like in the circuits, the motor circuits that are involved in Parkinson's disease, that's all computer guided. And, and guided by math and technology. We're not doing that freehand. We're aiming for tiny targets Patient awake? using precise frames. Often awake, usually awake. Oh, it's boy. actually safe to awake. And they feel I'm nothing. Out. They feel nothing. I'm right? out. They feel I'm nothing. out. The, I'm out. One of the great, <laughs> I'll give you a you know, really you no Ray Liotta, Liotta, You're thinking of Ray Liotta you're sitting ready? at dinner with That's Anthony right. Hopkins. Ray Liotta, Liotta was there. He's sitting at dinner. His skull is gone. And they're having spoonfuls of his brain and he's having a conversation. That's not bad. Is that real, by the way? Could that happen? I want to give you a really no really here, guys. You ready? Yeah. The brain has no feelings. There you go. I if understand. I, if I pin, <laughs> no, if, you pin, if I pinch your hand, it hurts. If I pinch your brain, you feel nothing. Yeah, but to get to my brain, you got to cut through my head. That's, that's true. <laughs> that what part I, you do feel. What am I, remedial? This guy's trying to sell me. A <laughs> okay, so that's a no, but when it, you get to your brain. It is remarkable, the though, that the brain itself has no feelings has no sensation you can you you do not feel any pain you feel pain of course when you cut the skin or the lining of the brain or the right. skull but once you're down to the brain itself there is no or a couple quickies wait, 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 wait. so it, but is everybody's brain I, i'll explain what i mean in a second the same like for instance i i'm left-handed is 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 that control always in the same part of the brain whether I'm left-handed or right-handed or, or is like oh this guy has his thing is in a different sector or 
Are, are they uh, identical? Which sector? What is it, Star Wars? <laughs> You're in a ship? I'm talking to a doctor. Would you <laughs> Don't be stupid. <laughs> there's a certain basic organization of the brain that's the same. But of course, there's a lot of variation within that. So you're absolutely right that left-handed people have a high likelihood that the left side of their brain is, I'm sorry, the right side of their brain is Oh, he got it wrong. Language versus, oh. uh, yeah. We you always know, check twice. Before you go in the doctor. <laughs> This is how my cousin look at him, look at him. lost a leg. He's not, you know, he's thinking that right now. He's thinking, wait a minute, yesterday's surgery. Did I do the left? Did I do the right? So, I know, like, if you cut Jason's head open to mine, my brain would be much bigger, correct? Um, there isn't a direct correlation with the size of the brain and intelligence. So, Thank you. even okay. if you're Thank smarter you. than Jason, your brain may not be bigger. So, right. with brain, and, and when we get specifics, because I want to read some stuff, claims, not to knock him, but that Elon Musk has said yeah. that they're doing, and I want to find out how close we are to that. But... The last thing on the mapping the brain, when you're doing surgery, do we know what every area of the brain does? Are we at the point where you so, know every inch, every micro inch or whatever that is, micrometer? We have a good understanding of the basic organization of the brain. And obviously there's a little variation from person to person, just as everyone has five fingers on their right hand, but everyone's right hand is a little different. So there is certainly some But they do know where the satiation center is, the, how to get to that yeah. to, and, and to make yes, somebody not yes. hungry? So there are satiety centers deep in the brain, and one of my colleagues here at Penn, you just happened to mention an area where we have the world expert here, is a, uh, a neurosurgeon named Casey Halpern, and he's actually doing surgery to try to control compulsive overeating by targeting a precise site in the brain and stimulating it when that urge to eat occurs that's normally uncontrollable in patients who have you know severe right. overeating disorders so yes we do have a sense wow. of where these areas are my particular interest for example is vision and i can tell you with excellent uh, precision i know what part of jason's brain and your brain is the area of the brain that's critical for visual perception of course there's a little variation in how each gyrus and sulcus is is patterned yeah, in each brain but we know the, the yeah, actual yeah yeah uh, that's on yeah, the same but, but, but that's what you've done. You, <laughs> you, you've restored sight. You've done surgeries that have restored people's sight. And, and We've enhanced done it. early efforts to restore sight for patients who are have acquired blindness. I want to make it clear, and, and I think we have to be very honest about what we do. We're early on this stage. The flying cars analogy is a great analogy that Jason mentioned earlier. We don't want to constantly saying our cars are flying or to borrow from Elon Musk, self-driving, until they really are. So, and, all right, so let me, let me... I'm going back to just say, tell your colleague with the overeating, I booked the flight, I'll be there Thursday. So just, just make a note. You do that, let him you, know if you tell me via this, I'll put a paper clip right in your ear, we'll do it right now. <laughs> so let me read a couple things that Elon Musk said, not to knock him, or, or just to give context, because he's the one who's saying this stuff can be done. Um, Musk claimed in human trials will begin in six months, but that's been for years, he's been saying human trials are gonna start soon. He says as soon as it happens, he's going to have it linked to himself. Um, and he said that it's going to be part of the brain, and the person who gets fitted would not even know they got fitted. So you like you go into a place. But and Musk sit the chair. is going to link it to himself for what? Just to goal. show here, because in Musk's mind, this is not what the doctor's doing to help people who are challenged or have problems. This is and to scale up because they're investing so much money, and they're all investing. Bill Gates is investing. Peter Thiel is investing. All the Silicon Valley guys are racing to invest money to be ahead of this because we talked about the metaverse. We talked about gaming. Engagement is what tech is all about. The longer you engage with tech, the more advertising, the more monetary things. So imagine if they can link you in 24-7 to gaming, to texting, whatever, and they have access. So that's what Musk is talking about. That is not to help somebody and enhance. It's more about the whole pub, that everybody in the public would have it. He said he's aiming for brain implants that would be available to any consumer who wants one. And the other thing he said was, his long-term plans, he thinks human brains need to be directly connected to phones, computers, and applications. You can run Google searches directly from your brain, or can even imagine connecting to someone else's mind, seeing and hearing what that other person is doing. And this is the science fiction part of what he said. Musk says all this is part of a strategy to offset the fact that artificial intelligence one day is going to get so smart that it poses a threat to mankind, so we need to be linked to AI to fight the evil AI. Yeah, that, there you go. So, Doc, Doc, you want to address that as far as linking, wow. linking to each other, seeing what the other person can see, etc. How close? Well, well, the history of this is is, is 
really interesting. And, and you're absolutely right. There's, there's a drive towards commercialization. Let me give you a little context from the area I work in, which is in vision. And of course, it's really interesting that you had William Shatner on, and obviously you guys are a little schooled in Star Trek. You remember the character uh, Jordy LaForge on Star Trek sure. with the visual prosthetic device? Yep. So that, like like everything in, 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 in art, there's a little bit of reality in that. And, and Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, was aware of this phenomena that we've known about for, for, for many decades, that even in a blind person, if you stimulate the visual part of the brain in the back of the head, even someone who has acquired blindness, who hasn't seen in 10, 20 years, you can make them see a spot of light because there's a precise map in the back of your brain. You asked me about the differences between people's brains. Your brains are both a little different. There is some individual variation, but each of you has precise maps in the back of your brain of the visual world. And the idea is we know the currency of the brain, the signals that go on in your brain between neurons, the currency is electricity. So we know if we can introduce electricity with great precision to those maps in your brain of the visual world, in theory, we can generate a pixel-based representation of the visual world. The idea is if someone's been blind for many years, their eyes are irreparably broken, we could use a camera that they could wear on a pair of glasses and attach that to a microcomputer and use that microcomputer to translate the image that is captured by the camera into a pattern of stimulation in your brain to create an image. So that that, that is tantalizing. People have worked on it for many years. Gene Roddenberry knew about this work when he invented a visual prosthetic in his imagined world of the 25th wow. century. What has people like Elon Musk and Bill Gates and all the, 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 the great industrialists and leaders in the computer world excited is 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was a great idea, but the technology was light years away. All of a sudden, with miniaturization and advanced engineering and advanced computers and microprocessors and artificial intelligence, what seemed to be a distant dream is probably not that far away. And scientists and physicians like me are very excited about harnessing this potential to help patients who suffer from diseases and impairments. You mentioned ALS and spinal cord injury for motor impairments or the inability to speak for victims of a stroke. There are people working on speech prosthetics. In my case, working on visual prosthetics for patients who are blind. But you're absolutely right that the in the military, they're interested in developing right. interfaces to allow soldiers to communicate without speaking and, and work in unison. There is deep interest in the computer community and, and the meta community that you spoke of. I mean, it, 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 another example is in my world of visual science which is the visual neuroscience, which is the study of how the brain takes images that are projected into the eyes and turns them into coherent percepts. A huge commercialization has developed, and that's the field of computer vision. So this business you saw in the newspapers where at Madison Square Garden, if you're a lawyer on the wrong list, they won't let you in the building. They're able to do that because they use computer vision to detect your face and say, person X is on the bad list, they can't come in the building. And that's an example of commercialization of science for purposes that some people Monitor, might well right. take issue with. Right. So. In, in talking about that, is there shared in, in science? Some share Intel, and the Neuralink, and those companies are proprietary. So if they're making advances, how do you find out what's going on if they're all proprietary and they're not shared? Because the advancement of medicine is about sharing, and a lot of times, a they don't want to share. The other thing that's happening today, where people call fake news, etc., is to cut through. Even in your world, people make statements that are not exactly accurate, like Theranos, you know, where it's hype because they need that to get funding, they need that to get attention. So how do you cut through that and go what is accurate and what's not and get the shared intel? I think that's a great question. In, in the world I live in, which is in the world of biomedical research and healthcare, the fundamental principle is we share what we know. We presented it national meetings, we publish it. Until you publish it in a peer-reviewed journal, it never happened. Mm. It doesn't matter. In the world of, of business, things operate a little differently. And I don't want to be too dismissive. Without business, 
we wouldn't right. have progress. Right. And, right. and there is a big interface between biomedical research and business, and it's critically important. But you're right that in business, exclusivity is, is, is their goal. Uh, and, and they want to keep things hidden very often because it advances their commercial interests. In science, yes, that is occasionally a, a problem, but for the most part, we do a really good job in sharing information because that's to the betterment of, of the science and that is really the fundamental goal. I think for the most part, people have benevolent influences, uh, benevolent impulses, I'm sorry, in the biomedical research community. And I've always been pleased and proud to be a part of this community where people are open and honest and share. And when they're dishonest, they get caught and they're done. There's no there's no leeway for scientific dishonesty. And and, and uh, that's a good thing. I have I have two questions going back a little bit because you were articulating <clears throat> about how what you're working on um, is very therapeutic for for a lot of um, physical ailments like ALS and blindness and whatnot. I think I was reading something about is, is there um, research being done on mental health issues and how this technology can help as well PTSD or trauma depression. or depression yeah. uh, what, what's absolutely happening there? that's that's a that's a really hot area again because drugs have done great things for patients with with psychiatric disorders but when you put a drug in a patient's body um, that goes all over the entire body it's being it affects every cell in the body and 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 the dream is if we can understand the circuits that are particularly involved in a condition like obsessive compulsive disorder or depression and we can target a device to just hit that part of the brain and alter the part of the brain that's working in in, in a way that's unhelpful to the patient's quality of life but not mess up the rest of the brain that's the dream and so there's active research at many leading centers in the country to develop brain stimulation devices that will ameliorate these these you know really terribly disabling disorders and you don't use this for mild depression that's doing well on antidepressant meds this right. is for the patients who really if we don't do something right. that, yeah i mean they're they're devastated so absolutely this is a big part of uh, of the scene right now and the work that's going on has never been more exciting uh than it is at this moment and what allows us to to push in that direction is the technology the engineering is, is yeah. at an incredible all-time high. In fact, the engineering has probably outpaced our understanding of the brain. Jeez. And that's probably more of what's holding us back. The brain is pretty damn complicated. So let me, let me, having understood all that, let me articulate what I think the average person's greatest fear about this is. If we can use technology to stimulate the brain um, especially in the areas of mental health where you're, where uh, one of the articles I read was that schizophrenia is potentially treated this way. It's what I said at the beginning of the show. It's a pathway in and a pathway out. So the the fear that I think un, uneducated little guys like me go is if I'm if my brain can be stimulated by something in this computer technology, anything in technology to my understanding is potentially hackable. And if somebody hacked it, are we in a position where I can be made to see things that do not exist? Is it the matrix? Can I be compelled to do things against my will? How potentially destructive or dangerous could this technology get? Right now you're safe because we're not that good. Uh, thank God. We can't control your brain. So thank God you're safe for now. But in theory, and you're absolutely right, there are technologies that both involve recording, gathering information from the brain. For example, a motor prosthetic in a patient who's paralyzed, we record the signals in the brain as the patient attempts to move an arm and translate that into moving a robotic arm. And that's an example of reading the brain. But we can also write into the brain. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to take a visual image, a picture captured by a camera and write that into the brain. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. There's both directions. Is active areas of research. Right now, I don't think you're at threat for mind control. Not that anyone wants to control your mind, uh, Jason, but uh, we're not, uh, <laughs> wow. God knows or what's in there. Wow. God knows what's in there. No one wants matter. to go, by the way, it's yeah. brain jacking. And you but know what? You know, As uh, I hear that, I go, so robotic arms, it's all Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Also liability. So I've got a robotic arm and I drop or kill somebody with a robotic arm accidentally. Who am I, who am I suing? Um, I got a paralyzed politician. 
that I can get hack into his his whole deal. What am I doing? And you got a there's a I don't know if you know the newer scientist Raphael Yusti Yusti sure and, sure oh you know okay so he Columbia. he did an experiment to Jason's point which he could not only read from the visual center of mouse brain but use the laser to make the animal perceive things that were not there. Absolutely. So that's that's pretty bold, yes. <laughs> It is bold, uh, but it and it is uh, certainly impressive, and he's a terrific. But scientist. he said he was concerned about well, that. It is it, it is going to be a concern as the technology, as the capabilities evolve. Right now, we don't have to worry about it today, but uh, it will be a date. concern, and I will tell date. you. We like to worry. What's the date? Ten years, five years, twenty years, forty years. Uh, let's say uh, 20 years. Well, but also, well, yeah, I'm sorry, please. It, 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 no, we, we I mean, I think that. that that's a fair concern. It's easy to villainize the bad people in the business world, but we won't get big, big progress if Unless. it's just a bunch of do-gooder do or doctors doing the work. So mm -hmm. there has to be engagement with industry, and industry right. does tremendous things. I will say none of this should happen in a vacuum. It's not like we're dropping these devices on the island in Lord of the Flies where there's no rules and everything runs wild. There has to be some some safety nets, some organization, some ethical principles. And, and to be fair, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, as they invest in brain research, have also invested heavily in the ethics of brain research. But the other so thing, there's this. Remember, the other thing though is these billionaires, and again, not to demonize them, but the big industry can also push back on regulations, get loopholes. You know, they're also the ones who move right. it that way, where it can be a little bit more dangerous. Well, we're that. dealing with, uh, we all know, you know, I heard AI is light years away from, and yet there's a reporter in the New York Times who had a conversation with the Bing chatbot, and the Bing chatbot going, I have thoughts that I don't like to share, and I, I could do nefarious things. So he's right. Stop me from hurting myself. I mean, it, it seems like it leaped you know, beyond anyone's expectation. And that's my concern about this. My other concern is, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong about this. So one of the things we were talking about is um, one of your colleagues' work was helping someone with ALS um, basically move a cursor uh, with their with their mind. And or control a robotic arm. Exactly. Yes, and, and that's exactly where I want to go. Because to me, the investment that I think would be valuable is making a human being uh, giving them back more of a human experience. So to me, if my brain can control something, I don't want to control the mouse with my mind. I want to control my robotic arm with my mind and manipulate the mouse. I would personally be frightened by being connected to that hackable um, uh, piece of technology. Why, why not build these things so it so my, my the the thing i compare it to is there's now a device that diabetics can wear where it monitors their glucose level and self-administers insulin yeah. they don't need to tie into a computer network it's all autonomous on their body why it why wouldn't the research push more to that side than to the let's connect to the inter internet Well, side? but there is a computer even in the diabetes example there's a little microprocessor in that device so you're, you're, everything's hackable. Even if it's in your body, it's all hackable. Um, and um, I think when, when, when scientists, like the ALS example you gave, when they're focused on a mouse, that's just because that's the incremental step. You start with something simple, and then you work on a robotic arm, then you work on a, an Iron Man suit, and- um, Oh wait, now you're talking to me. Oh, wait a minute, no. hang on. Is that a possibility, the Iron Man suit? <laughs> uh, uh, of course it's a possibility. Go, absolutely. go, go forward. You know go, what? go with God. You know, you know, you know Musk has it <laughs> You're way behind the curve. You just don't know. He's wow. got it. So let's go with the nitty gritty. Yeah. I'm just curious. Your day, uh -huh. you get up at five in the morning, you have some grapefruit, I'm guessing you're eating healthy because you're a doctor. At what, at, on surgical days, what's your earliest surgery? When do you open up the first head? Oh. We start at 7.30. That's oh, my start. God. Unless it's an emergency. And how long now, because you're the guy, the big guy, head's already open? We, we're we involved in every step. Oh, of so you're the guy who cuts her. You're, it's not like, Louie, you uh, take it and I'll come in? Uh, we're involved in you're every doing the whole step. Day. Okay. We have residents who work with us, but we're involved in How long is the around. average brain surgery? Uh, average one is four to six hours, I would say. Oof. And then do you two multiples in a day? Yeah. You know, yes. Wow. Yes. Wait, wow. You, never, you never worked yes. a 10 hour day? Not where I'm doing the thing. Are you robotic? Mostly robotic? Um, we use a lot of uh, 
robotic guidance, uh, computer guidance. So we have like a GPS system that tells us exactly. So was that you and an 18 year old IT guy or? <laughs> no, no, well, we, we control the, uh, the, the GPS. And if you have a problem, you call like, the Best Buy, what do they call it, the Genius Squad? <laughs> yeah, the Genius Squad. <laughs> 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 hey guys, guys, we're the guys, guys, <laughs> guy's brain, it's not working. You said the wi is not going down. And by the way, we about that, in the hospital. we do this all the time with Zoom, et cetera. And I guess a lot of these services, we're not prepared for COVID for everybody doing stuff so the service can drop out or not. Do you have backup on Wi-Fi and Bluetooth? What happens if the thing goes out? We have we have backup. We have backup. You're looking at him smiling. Well, like, everything is, let me, say, you let me ask you this. If you were doing this in Los Angeles and there was a little bit of an earthquake, are you prepared for that? Is anything? <laughs> we are prepared. We are prepared. Wow. Oh, you're having a bad day. Wow. I don't know if you're married, but the wife says, Billy got drunk last night. It's going to cost us 20000 bucks. Does that affect your surgery? Or because it's robotic no awesome? No bad days allowed. No bad no days, bad days allowed. allowed. Wow. Honestly. I mean, you know, it's our job to to put put all that aside when we're working on a patient. That's the center of the universe right. at that moment. That's not just me. That's everybody in the in the business of neurosurgery. Sure. While you're in the operating room, no bad days. You're what about hair patient. restoration? Is anybody working on that? <laughs> anybody? You know, it's funny you mentioned that. I had a colleague who, who who passed away a couple of years ago. A guy named Phil Gildenberg who. He took the navigate the idea of the navigation device, the robotic arm device that we use in brain surgery, and and filed for a patent to use that same device to do hair transplant surgery. Have a robot and put in each follicle one at a time. Oh, so tough. I'll be there. Uh, I'll be there a but, week. But, but just like with satiation, <laughs> they're racing to. If they could figure that out, that's another. The fa the exactly. obesity thing and the hair thing were the two biggest as far as money. I mean, I would is, I would be a. Comp so I have a different it? career. They, they haven't found that center yet. Two really. implants, and all of a sudden, I'm I'm George Clooney. <laughs> well, well, mm. what you you doubt me? No, you no, doubt no, me? no, absolutely. You're saying I couldn't no, be George been Clooney. Been, yeah, you. What is been, George Clooney got besides hair nothing, nothing. and a waistline? Really, that I it's don't another have. episode of really, Please, no, really, really, really. You don't think I could be Danny Ocean? Excuse me, a second. Laurie, if you can get Clooney on the phone, just to give you don't have to even call us. Just give us a list of the differences. What does John Hamm well, have I think that the doctor, I don't have? I think the doctor can do that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need Clooney to tell us that. Doctor, I know that you're busy. Like, so, how annoyed are you right now that we're dragging this out because you're missing a patient? I know you got to be out in about a minute and a half. This is a pleasure. And oh. to have smart guys like you talking about these issues, it's, you know, to the to the general, uh, to the, the intelligent lay people, it's really important. That may not be our audience. That Don't assume. That may not be our demographic. One can only hope. But I hope. I, I hope will it, say, it moves the, one, what would thing, it move you, I hope one it moves. thing you hit on that I thought was quite interesting was this idea of, in medicine and in biomedical research, we're, we're, we're expected to report on results that are proven. And in the world of high tech and commercialization, you mentioned, um, 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 the problem that the fake it till you make it sort of culture, yeah, the right. culture yeah, of, yeah. of saying we can do this. Like, right. like, what? What I don't think those guys started out being dishonest. I think they were in this culture of saying, this is our dream and we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We need the investments. We're going to do this. We don't do that in in hospital and biomedical research there are lives at stake and we cannot and we will not do well that. thank you for that because there is in, in, in prepping i did talk radio for a lot of years and you notice in every field now to cut through the noise and the theranos was a great example look how many people they get involved who are major people on the board there for a hype thing that they I, i'm sure they thought fake it until you make it we'll get enough money that we'll finally be able to do this thing they were never even close though but hype raises a level of awareness and it gets you research and investment. So uh, it, it's pretty amazing. Thanks for coming on. So 10 years. We're 10 years away from that. Um, do you have a he surgery? He said 20. He said 20. He said 10. Cut it in half. Um, <laughs> you have a surgery plan right after us? Uh, just have clinic today. No, sir. Oh, yes, wash, wash your hands. Wash your hands. Very clean. There you go. You're a, great, you're a great guy. Thanks for playing, but also thanks for being. So, look him up. I mean, give him his credit. We'll give the credits at the end of the show, but what you do is amazing work there in my hometown. I see Penn right behind you in the logo. Uh, I know right where you are down We'd love to have dinner with you. I hope to never see you on a professional level. That's all I'm going to say. The, you're a you genius. Know it. You'd be I like, just don't want to need your service because I'll be the first guy. He touches the brain. I go, I'll feel it. Feel it. You know what? I'm feeling it. You wouldn't know it. You'd be like Ray Liotta. We'll be having dinner with him out there. And the doctor, I could be Ray Liotta oh, if I had that surgery. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh man, rest in peace. And doctor, thank you so much. 
David Guggelheim, <laughs> what did we learn that we didn't learn? What do you got for us? Lesser, yes. Well, I have to fact check this uh, doctor. He doesn't know. No, I, oh. Every, every, <laughs> everything was great. The one thing that I wanted to get to was uh, something that was uh, described in Business Insider, how the Neuralink, the, the, the uh, Elon Musk company, how they plan to implant these things into your head it would be inserted into the brain by a device not dissimilar to a sewing machine, which would use a stiff needle to poke the threads into place about one millimeter millimeter into the outer surface of the brain or the cortex. So you could go to a place and say, I need this put in, and I need, I need my, no, pants my pants back shorter. by 3 o'clock. Yeah, right, yeah, exactly. exactly. I knew exactly where you were going. I knew exactly. And that would be it's amazing. As if we were linked. <laughs> that would be amazing technology. Wouldn't it be your pants and your brain done at the same place? Well, remember, David, what we said, Mr. Guggenheim, that there is a, and they all do it, there is a level of hype, even in the scientific world, because they need it to cut through the noise. So when you see, if, you're, if you work in news like I did every day, the ones that get pushed out are the ones that are a little bit more dramatic. Right. Sure. Um, you like to think that they're being honorable and they're being, uh, you know, like he said, that in the scientific community they don't BS. But there's hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars being invested in Silicon Valley now because they think this is the next frontier. But uh, you know, uh, also your your brain is the last place with brain hacking, like you said, with privacy. They download your neural file. It's somewhere, and somebody uploads your neural file, and they got your thoughts. Listen, th this whole thing, uh, I, I totally understand the, the benefits of being able to use this technology to vastly improve people's lives. I could even see, honestly, that it could be an exciting way for people to have experiences they could not otherwise afford or be able to do. If you can imagine, if you can, if you can input in and stimulate sight, sound, taste, all that stuff, and use it to say to somebody, all right, you're, you're going to travel today. You're going to go to this place and have a complete sensory understanding of that place. Um, I think that could be exciting. I, I think. By the way, that's I, I think called the metaverse. All, that's what. Yeah, <laughs> I think there's all kinds of potentially that's exciting. That's actually called Total Recall. That's right, exactly. Schwarzenegger movie right, right. or Total Recall. But you know, yeah. th there are things that I, I, I think as we move forward are, are going to excite the imagination of how to use this, but. I just, to me, the whole world is Skynet. I keep seeing somebody nefariously using this technology to implant um, a, a, a reality that doesn't exist. And all of a sudden you're picking up rocks and piling them. You're, you're, you're sitting in goo like Keanu Reeves, you know, you know my, and the machine you know is sucking off of you for, for nutrition. I, it's sucking just, off of you. So here's it, my final word. Ready? Here's what I think. If they can download you neurally, I'll be canceled. For something I didn't even know I was thinking. They go, how dare you? I go, what? We downloaded you neurally and you can't believe what you were in there. It was, you said, I didn't say that. Oh, it was in there. And all of a sudden, yeah, wow. No, you're right. Then it's thought, please. And it's all that other stuff. How many and we're there. Yeah, and we're there. Times have you thought, the good thing oh, is, well, the good thing is with the two of us, not a lot of thoughts. So they yeah. would probably, by the way, they don't have enough police right now to work on the stuff they need to work on. So if you, let me ask you a question. If you could. Is that the question? Interface with the, right now today. If you could interface <laughs> with me. the yes. technology that you use, you use most often, just by no, having a link in your uh, head. I use it when you go ahead. Yeah, just by having. Oh my God, it'd be in great. Head, it would be great. You would do it. It's just it's t it's one step up for the wireless earbuds. I boy, you. I could not check my. Head. I could check my uh, my Amazon purchases without having to do. Why didn't that arrive? I ordered that Thursday. Oh my you, God! Yes. You oh yes. Get me yes. To I'm a busy guy. In a gazillion. I know, but we can't get you to do a lot of tech stuff. Well, that's true. You got a dumb house. Remember, we talked about that episode. You don't, I don't have, have a dumb house. I have a human house. Oh, oh, damnation to all of us that have tech and no, use it. No, I have a human house. I don't rely on technology to do a lot of the things that people rely on it Which for. Is why I don't need a, a refrigerator to tell the supermarket what I need. I can open the door and make a list and, you know, By the way, phone uh, at your house last get. time, nothing to eat. There's nothing good to eat. <laughs> so maybe you should use maybe the double thing. Well, you know, you make fun. You go ahead and make fun. I'm telling you, this is a scary technology. I want to sit on the toilet. And when I'm done, it says high blood pressure. Uh, I would have this checked. I would do. They have toilets now that check your your heart rate, your this, your beat. Why not? It saves you time. Why does every conversation with you get down to something on the toilet? Because everybody 
Have you never David, read I want you me. to go back through Excuse every me. episode. Everything we've ever Excuse taken me. out is all about a toilet. Have you never read There is a because Freudian you make it, phase you make in it your dirty. development. This is not dirty. I'm talking about... It doesn't matter. That's the dirty. next technology. As a matter of fact, everything South Downs. Park episode about... Did you see the South Park <laughs> episode where the guy has to replace his toilet and it's his old pink toilet and he goes to the store and it's the, I forget which is the father that's the pot dealer, but he's wealthy. He said, we're like the Kennedys. Of the family. And he goes to the appliance store and they have the toilets and he's got his old toilets replacing and they go, so is that the most expensive? Because I have money. And they go, well, the better ones are the Japanese toilets. And there's a guy in a suit with a velvet rope and he goes into that department and it does, the light goes on, it cleans you, it tells you temperature, it does this, and he brings it home and the wife says, so how much was that? He goes, 10, 10, 10, 10 what? 10K. <laughs> she goes, 10K, he says, just go in there, go in there. And she goes in and you hear her in the breath going, ooh, we're not giving this back. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the technology is that everything's going to link to be a smart device so they can tell what's going on with you so you don't have to have a Fitbit. On the other hand, where all that intel goes is to a company that now has all your intel. And what are you telling me? I know that. That's why I'm not engaging. That's, I'm not doing it. I have no interest. It's fine. You can do it. I do. That's why I have to do all the research for the show. He goes, I, I, won't, I won't link. I don't oh, link. well, you'll do it on the toilet, apparently. <laughs> oh, you, see, you're making it a negative. I made it a positive. It was a place that can actually do a medical evaluation. You're doing yeah. it. As a, and you're, you're the guy it. in the you're stall the who, when I have to go, never gets out because you're doing research. I know how you roll. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. We want to thank Dr. Daniel Yosher. A beautifully nationally recognized neurosurgeon and oh, neuroscientist. Beautifully, you beautifully. Beautifully, I'm like I'm like Trump. I add words. He was amazing. He, he was, was wonderful. He's also the he chair of the amazing. Department of Neurosurgery <laughs> in the Perelman School of Medicine <laughs> at the University of Pennsylvania. You can follow Dr. Yosher and uh, his mind-boggling work on Twitter at Daniel Yosher. Uh, you can find us online at yeah. reallynoreally.com. Well, uh, Instagram and TikTok, also we're tech. at Really No Really Podcast. Uh, you can leave us messages anywhere or those places. Tell us one of your Really No Reallys. Really Maybe we'll do it on the show. Uh, we want to thank uh, producer uh, Dave and producer Lori for being with us today. We want to thank all of you. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, please tech. subscribe we'll be tech. and rate us. Rate me. <laughs> Give me my value, then you can rate toilet boy here and then uh, we also want to tell you that we will be dropping uh, you like I said dropping and toilet you and know saying, what you just take something that is pure and innocent and medical and you just sully it dropping new episodes every Tuesday so should be sure to follow us on the iHeartRadio app the Apple app or wherever you get your podcast we'll see you soon I'm thanks for watching up. and uh, I'm, I'm first severing the link right my now. first choice was to do this with but he said no here I am link. here we go and <laughs> severed